Uh, we're getting ready to start a new term here at Noman, uh, so we're looking forward to seeing many new friendly faces around campus from Monday. I know we have some alumni here tonight too, so it's good to see you too. Um, enrollment for summer term classes ends July 21st, so if you've been on the fence, uh, be sure to check out what seats are available on our individual on-campus and online classes by heading to noman.edu. Uh, so we're streaming live from Hollywood tonight, so hello as well to everyone watching on live stream on Facebook. Uh, we're happy to have you all with us uh, for an evening with Servios, um, an awesome VR studio based here in Los Angeles. Uh, we have a fantastic presentation lined up for you by four incredible talents at Servios, uh, who will be talking us through career realities and industry expectations. We'll hear advice on how to prepare for careers in games. Uh, we'll learn about the VFX work involved in real-time VFX for VR, and we'll also get some expert tips on how we can project manage our own games to make them, help make them a success. Uh, so from your right to left, we have Justin Curry, a lead artist at Servios. Hi Let's guys. have a round of applause for Justin. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Next to Justin, we have John Kim, senior animator. <laughs> Next up is James Littlejohn. I think my, oh yeah, my mic cut out for a second there. And last but not least, sorry, on the left here we have Kevin Wilson, senior environment artist. So, so as you can see, we have some awesome talents here for you, to guide you tonight with Careers that have spanned AAA games, previous for blockbuster movies, VR, filmmaking at Oculus Story, 3D work for games, films, broadcast, advertising, so much more. So amazing talents up here. So be sure to make the most of the event, ask questions, take notes, chat with our speakers after the event ends, and just have fun. Uh, we have a VR station here too, um, so you'll be able to check out uh, Servius's VR game, Raw Data. So we'll play the, that a little later, and I believe we'll also get it up and running during the Q&A session, so look out for that. Um, so if you do have questions for speakers tonight, um, the Q&A session, we'll bring around the mic to you. So please wait for the mic and raise your hand. We'll bring it to you. Uh, for those online, you can submit questions on the live stream live chat or on Twitter using hashtag Nomen. Uh, you're welcome to comment on Facebook Live, but please be sure to tweet or live chat with us to make sure your questions reach the team. Uh, we have some awesome prizes tonight too, courtesy of Servios. Uh, we have four awesome prize bundles of shirts and hats, mm. and we also have this really cool uh, JBL wireless headset. So make sure you stick around to the end of the event, and we'll choose five lucky winners uh, at random from tonight's audience. So keep hold of those little raffle tickets. Online viewers, to enter to win a one-month subscription to the Noman Workshop Training Library, please share tonight's uh, live stream event URL on Twitter using hashtag Noman, uh, and we'll select one winner at random at the end of the event. Uh, if you're watching on Facebook, to find the event URL, just head to livestream.com forward slash Noman. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to thank Drew Greeley, uh, Director of Talent at Servios. So he's brought tonight's panel together for us, and he's been super awesome. Um, we should have a round of applause for Drew, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have several Noman alumni working at Servios now, too, and some of them are here tonight. So huge thanks to the crew for supporting uh, talented Noman alumni. We know they're all having a blast at your studio, so uh, we're super proud of them too. So, <laughs> um, And finally, I'd like to thank our event sponsor, Lenovo, for helping us to bring these free events to you. Tonight's presentation is powered by Lenovo and Intel technology, which our students also use here on campus. So without further ado, let's have one big round of applause for tonight's guests, and I'll hand over to Justin. All right. Thank you. All right, guys. Well, thanks for having me. I'm Justin Corey. I'm the lead artist over at Servios. Um, I've been with the company for about three years now. This month actually marks my uh, three-year anniversary. So I just want to say thank you for having me. Uh, I've come to these talks many times over the years, and it's very odd for me to be up here talking now. So I really appreciate it, and I uh, hope you guys enjoy it. So we're going to start off with a uh, trailer from our early access uh, version of Raw Data. So take a look. Do we not have audio though? Uh oh, uh oh. Hold on. Let me make sure we're. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Give us just a moment. All right. Thank you, sir. All right. Stop. Do you even know why you're really here? You call yourselves a resistance. But what are you resisting? Advancement. Evolution. Immortality. You think you're free. But you're not. You are simply... A weapon. Data breach detected. Initiating facility meltdown. watching that guys okay so we are going to talk about how do we get a job in games all right so about me I started working in games as a technical artist right out of school um, worked for two and a half years at a company called Nova Logic and then had been contracting in between gigs from movies to games and eventually was hired over at Servios in 2014 and it's been a great ride since then and yeah, helped develop raw data from the ground up when it was literally nothing but just some gray boxes. And uh, today we're going to talk about graduates and graduation and uh, what you want to do versus what you can do. What does it mean between being an artist and a developer? What are some of the things that I do at Servios? And what do I look for when I hire people? And some of the best practices that you should uh, keep in mind when you're at work. So you graduated, right? So who here has graduated already? Who here is a student? Anybody? No? Okay, never mind. <laughs> Go to school. All right, so anyway, so this will be good for anybody watching that's still in school. So it, what do you do right now after you've graduated? Well, before you graduate, you probably should be uh, sending out resumes and looking for a job. Um, and if you've managed to actually get a job, that's great. And you've succeeded. You don't need to listen to me anymore. But if not, you know, it's time to uh, buckle down and get serious and get stuff done. Um, so, again, uh, one of the things I think that people need to think about when they're getting into games or getting into the movies, and all this is applicable across both sides, is that you may have your passion that you really want to do, but you're not always going to have the opportunity to do that because, uh, you know, it's a very competitive field. There's a lot of talented people all around the world all vying for jobs. Um, so what you need to do is come to terms and go, okay, well, what, what else interests me? What are things that I know I can do and I'm good at? And start pursuing those things, but while at the same time chasing after your passion. Um, and again, you can add a ton of value to yourself when you're going and looking for jobs by just having a ton of other skill sets. Um, so one of those things for sure is just what do you do in your spare time? So I like to work on character art when I can. And, and by the way, I don't do character art as a uh, profession. I just am at home when I'm working on these things. And, just coming up with collection of stuff and you know diversity is also really good so make sure you're doing hard surface, you're doing organic, you're doing characters, you're doing environments. Uh, maybe even a little animation is a good way to go. But uh, yeah, so if you haven't gotten a job doing what you want to do, that's okay. It's not over. You just got to keep trying at it. 
Um, so <clears throat> being an artist, a lot of everybody here are artists. They like to make art and art is great. But you also have to understand the implications of when you make art and how does that go into a game engine, for instance. So there's things you can ask yourself. Does my art look pretty? Meaning, is it visually stimulating? Does it, does it, does it appeal to people? But also, is my art performant? Is it something that's optimized? Is it something that I can put into the game and make sure that it just doesn't kill our performance? Um, and do I understand how my art's gonna be used? So depending on what kind of asset you're building, you're gonna need to think about how is this gonna be used in the game? Is it a rock? Is it something that's gonna be a gun or a weapon? Or is it gonna be a character? And all these things are gonna get built very differently. Um, and when you're done, did you integrate it yourself? Is the art in the game? And when the art's in the game and it's performant, it means you're done. Um, and another big one, because you're gonna be sharing with people all the time, is can I actually hand my work off to somebody and will they be able to understand what's in that file when I open it or is it just a giant mess? So uh, house cleaning and housekeeping is very important when you're working. Um, now, again, artist versus developer. Making, you know, I worked on the gunslinger hands for the game. It's one of the first characters we, we put in, or actually his name is Bishop now, but he originally was the gunslinger. But uh, I'm just giving you an example of, you know, uh, something that is anatomically correct, also something that's physically correct, um, something that works, but it is also, you know, neat design, at least I feel so. And then next to that, you'll see the amount of work to just achieve something in real time, which is your UV layout to the right. Um, having very tight UVs, having very clean UVs is probably the most important part outside of the art, just looking pretty. You need to make sure that it's technically sound and you're giving yourself the best opportunity to show that by having great UV pages. Um, and again, the implementation of it now, you're seeing the, what the character's hand is in game, it's animating, it's, uh, yeah, a lot of work just to get these things in game. Um, so yeah, understanding how the, you know, when I make these hands, what is the topology supposed to be like? Is it gonna actually function? Is it gonna deform properly? And what you're seeing right now in this animation, by the way, is a gun twirl that Mr. Keith Bruns there in the front crowd, he uh, made this animation that when you see that gun twirl in the beginning of the game, that's that guy's animation. Um, also, he works with all the rigging and helps me out, and I, you know, we've been working together for quite a long time on the animation systems in Unreal. Um, so what I do at Servios, I do management, I build assets, I help build the worlds, I do scripting, I do some animation, rigging, uh, all the interactables that the game has, I've touched at some point to help troubleshoot or just help to get set up, as well as the characters, I do a lot of the troubleshooting for just character animation in, in general, and optimization, one of the biggest things that since I've joined the company, I've learned quite a lot about um, and am now a big advocate for making sure things are optimized. Bug fixes, tons of times when you change something or you're trying to improve something, you break the game and somebody's got to go in and try and fix it and figure out what's going on. And of course, I annoy people. I'm very good at that. Uh, so here's another example of stuff that I've done. This is a new environment that we've built. You saw it in the trailer. This is the Block Gardens. Um, and I built out this, uh, this room here with the collaboration of other artists. Uh, we had Rodrigo Brea, who's up front, help us out. Did some vegetation work, some rock work. He did quite a bit once he joined us. Um, so yeah, this is the attunement chamber that you go into. It's one of the last areas you'll visit, but this is not out yet, so you'll get a chance to play it pretty soon. And I got to work on this awesome Buddha. So I sculpted it all in ZBrush, did, and then did all the uh, emissive tech lines using uh, a substance pass. So substance actually has been a pretty integral uh, part of our pipeline. Um, so what do I look for when I hire? Um, there's quite a few things I'm gonna look for. I'm gonna definitely be looking at your portfolios and I'm gonna try to figure out what is it that you enjoy doing or what is it that you can do. I and mean, a lot of the times I'll, uh, I'll look at people's work and they might have a great resume but I don't quite know what they do. So it's very important that when you're uh, trying to get a job, you are including as much personal work as possible because that's going to give me the best insight to know what exactly you can do and what do you enjoy making. What kind of styles do you like to work in? Um, if I get a website that just has game screenshots, it's very hard for me to understand what your contribution was there and, again, what do you really enjoy doing? Um, and then art tests. Never be shy to take an art test. I've done many, 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 some of them 60 hour tests, some of them 90 hour tests. And some of those responses come back in you know, an hour or two and they tell you no and you just move on to the next thing. So definitely uh, do your best on art tests. I get art tests back from people and sometimes I just go, I feel like they didn't care to do their best on it and it shows and 
it's you're wasting your time, you're wasting my time, but I say do your best on anything you do. Um, again, I'm always looking to see people who are interested in different things. Um, I get a lot of uh, I get a lot of people who are afraid to talk about their interests when I interview them, but I encourage people to always just be very open about the things you like because it just helps me understand who you are as a person. Um, somebody who's extremely technical is obviously extremely valuable. So good technical aptitude is a good way to go. Um, I will probably pick somebody who's more technical than somebody who's a great artist, but at the same time, those, are, those can be exchanged. If somebody's a fantastic artist, but maybe not so technical, uh, I'll probably do my best to teach them how to be technical. Um, and of course, please have a great personality and a good attitude. It doesn't mean be the most outgoing person ever, but definitely, you know, be communicative, uh, enjoy smiling, talking, um, and that's going to get you very far, at least in the initial stages. Uh, for sure, you need to be somebody who's interested in growing professionally, meaning uh, you're not just trying to silo down into one job. Um, that's not necessarily what I'm looking for, but again, if you are exceptional at those things, I'm going to give you a shot. Um, and again, willingness to wear multiple hats. So as the industry is growing and these new VR companies are coming up, they're going to be very small. And with that means your, your responsibilities are going to grow because there's not going to be enough people to handle all the different jobs that you're going to need to do. So it's very good to hear that somebody wants to actually learn things and, and probably has already done those things on their own. Um, and people who have used tons of different software packages outside of just modeling in one package or you know, knowing ZBrush, knowing Substance, knowing Unreal, knowing other game engines, knowing Max, doing all these things just to add a curiosity is a really good thing to do because when you go to any job, you'll now have this kind of built up ability to kind of dig in and figure out how the software works. So I recommend that definitely expand your uh, software package knowledge. Um, so, okay, so now we're gonna talk about some of the things that work that are the most important. So time management, this is something that I think a lot of people don't really understand the implications of until you've uh, had your back up against the wall. So making sure that you're able to stick to a deadline and be, be self-aware of, uh, you know, how much time you're actually putting into things. So time management is probably one of the biggest. And I, you know, I mentioned earlier uh, having something that you can hand off to somebody so that they can open it and work on it. So clean working scenes. It's amazing some of the stuff you'll see when you open up <coughs> another person's work and you, you, know, you quickly realize how difficult that can make your life. Um, you wind up wasting a lot of time that you wouldn't normally. Um, and clear thought about how your art's going to be used. So again, if it's something that's going to be animating or if it's you know, like a character or a weapon, all these things need to have to really be thought out very clearly and be built in a way that they're going to function and that they're just you know, easy to integrate and work with, very clean. Um, UVs, UVs, the biggest and most annoying thing for any artist who works in games will do is UVs. Although it gets easier over time the more you do it. So I recommend spending as much time as you can learning how to efficiently unfold UVs. And I'm not going to tell you how that works right now because that's going to take a long time, so forget that. Um, but uh, in relation to the UVs, you'll have clean bakes. Clean bakes are uh, some of the toughest things to do, especially when you're working with hard surface models. Um, there's so many, uh, there's so many uh, specific things that you need to keep in mind when you are doing UVs. And also just on your model in general, the, uh, the normal, normal smoothing and normal grouping. These are things that people generally don't think about when they're doing their meshes. So you wind up having some, some things that maybe not, may not be so obvious initially, but you'll, when somebody shows you the difference, you clearly can see it. Um, and then being able to self-integrate your art, meaning not just being able to create something and then pass it off, but being able to take it the whole way through. So can you put it into the engine? Can you hook it into a, uh, a component to a class? Like is it, if it's an interactable or if it's an animated character, being able to understand where all those things are in the engine is extremely important. Um, and again, anybody who can do that is good in my book. So uh, being able to test your art before submitting, meaning uh, I guess the best way to put this is if you put a gun in the game, can I pick the gun up? Can I, can I interact with the gun? If I can't do that, then I have no business submitting this stuff. So just making sure that you take the time to uh, proof, your, proof your work. 
Um, a lot of times people fire and forget and they don't realize that they may have broken something. So this will bum out a lot of people if you don't test out your work before it goes through the pipeline. And then please, yeah, always communicate with your team members. I mean, a lot of people are scared to uh, talk about that they're having trouble with some work or that they might be slipping on their timelines. But at the end of the day, if you let people know, you let your leaders know that something's going wrong or you may not make it, I'm always more than, well, you know, more than happy to come and sit down with you and guide you through things and teach you what's up and just get it through the finishing line. And eventually, you'll, you'll be fine on your own without me pretty quickly. But uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. I just wanted to say thank you guys again for uh, letting me come and talk. And uh, hopefully some of what I had to tell you was uh, useful to you. And yeah, good luck. All right, thank you, Justin. All right, thank you again, Noman, for having us. I'm happy to be here. And today, I'd like to talk to you guys about how to prepare yourself for the game industry as an animator. Um, uh, first off, my name is John Kim. I'm a senior animator at Servios. Uh, I've been working in the industry for about 20 years now. And I'd like to share some of my, share some of my experiences and offer um, some suggestions uh, for your job preparation. All right, so let's begin. So these are some of my uh, work experiences. Um, some of the notable ones are Jack and Daxter and Uncharted. Uh, I did a small stint on movies for Star Trek Beyond. And um, uh, this definitely makes me look old, so I'm going to move on. <laughs> um, so, so starting with um, surviving during the early years of, of your animation training. Uh, becoming an an animator, of course, as you know, is uh, super hard. Uh, you need a lot of stamina, drive, passion, uh, instructors, and friends to uh, make it through. Um, so surround yourself with talented and supportive people. It's too difficult to learn animation on your own. Uh, be helpful to your peers. Uh, stay close to your instructors that will keep you on track. Um, take advantage of the networking opportunities um, right here at Noman. And this is a, a, a truly a valuable environment and time to be in. And um, so my personal story, you know, during my school years, uh, when I first got into school, I somehow luckily made friends with uh, some of the graduating seniors. And, and they shared with me their, uh, their reels and portfolios, and, and I had a really kind of an eye-opening experience where, so I guess that's the end goal. That's, that's what's, what it's all about. You want to... Uh, really develop your skills to uh, shine and, and make something uh, that's presentable to an employer uh, so you can get a job. So, so they showed me their work and you know, they were really uh, welcoming and, um, and I learned uh, quite a lot from them. And to this day, um, and that was 21 years ago, um, I'm still really good fr friends with them. They're doing really well in the industry. Uh, we still uh, give feedback, we encourage each other, so, um, so s start today and, and start networking. So eat, sleep, dream animation. So welcome to the marathon. You're training like an athlete to climb Mount Everest of animation. Uh, find creative ways to stay motivated. Um, so one of the... So one of my experiences, uh, one of the things that, um, that I did to motivate myself uh, was uh, every single day during school, um, I would draw a cartoon. I would draw a little comic of, of some, something that happened during the day, something that inspired me, or, or just some funny comment that my friend made. So it's really just kind of, kind of a fun comic for myself. So I did a, a drawing every single day, and I posted it um, on my wall, like one every day. So in my dorm room, my entire wall at the end of the semester will be uh, covered with, um, with these drawings. So, so that's one way to kind of remind myself that I'm physically creating this tangible like, artwork. I mean, it's not, it wasn't that great, but it made me happy. It made me feel like I'm an artist. Um, and and the, other, the other thing that I did was I constantly kept uh, some of the inspiring anim, um, 
animated movies on, on repeat. So I'm eating, I'm watching, I'm, surround, I'm physically surrounded by my artwork, um, professionals' artwork. Uh, essentially, you're, I was just consumed. And so that was kind of my uh, technique. And I wasn't really thinking about it. I just thought it was a fun thing to do, kind of looking back. And that really did um, uh, get me motivated. And of course, uh, friends drop in and, and they ask me, hey, what's, what's this? What's that? And that's a, that's a great little conversation starter. And, um, and it, it was fun. All right. So, so during your animation studies, you're going to feel a lot of struggles, frustrations, uh, self-doubts. One second, I just lost my spot. Okay, so, so this is normal. Um, it, you're growing and you'll continue to feel this way during your growth as an animator. Um, so don't feel terrible. I mean, you will feel terrible, but don't feel terrible like it's the end of the road, like you cannot do it. You can do it, it's just, it's, you're, just, you're, just you're only human. And when difficult things, uh, you know, uh, block your way, it, you're gonna feel pretty crappy and um, so w what do you do? Um, take a break, take a breather, step back, do something completely different, just reset yourself. Um, and when you come back to it, if you need help, um, ask your peers, ask your instructors to get you back on track. So keep calm, stay focused, and continue animating. So join a team or build a team. One second, lost my place again. Game development is a team environment. Uh, join a group that's making a prototype game. You'll get a, you'll get a taste of what it's like to work, in, work with different disciplines, personalities, and development tools. I hear uh, Noman has a uh, game jam. Let's go ahead and join that. I think that's a great, great idea. And it's a really valuable opportunity. And I hear uh, a lot of other schools, um, USC, uh, to mention one of them, they do encourage that. And it's been really successful. And I've seen a lot of talented, great works com come out of uh, groups uh, like that and schools that encourage that. And so I would literally sprint to any opportun organized opportunities like these. So congratulations, you got your first job. Um, so what do you do now? So what would you, ex uh, your expectations versus reality. So your expectations may, may be to learn from masters like the nine old men. So there's a, there's a guy waiting for you to uh, to train you, you are eager, you are ready. Um, and a chance to work on super cool animations. So your expectations might uh, be that they have a training roadmap for you. Starting from level one and guide you all the way through level 99. So you grow into a powerful animator. You may also expect a well-documented company manual that shows you exactly what to do, how to do it, who to ask, and where things are in this well-organized company. The, real the reality is, is tight schedules. Um, it's results-driven. Seniors have little, little time to sit down and train you. Your animation work can be mindless and uninspiring. Tasks are handed to you in various uh, difficulty levels. So welcome to the jungle. So the company is your jungle. It is, it is new, you, it's a foreign land. You don't really know all the people. You don't really know where things are, maybe, I guess you'll be lucky, you know, you know where some of the bathrooms are. It's just, it's just a new place. Um, so, you'll, so basically, you'll, quick, you'll need to quickly uh, learn to survive, um, quickly learn the survival skills to navigate this confusing, 
forest of game development. So, so, one, so one note about uh, the company of the jungle, this, this new foreign land. So the company has been there long before you got there. Uh, know the company's uh, workflow, the culture, who does what, and where things are. Um, disorganized or, or organized, it may, it may be, it's their system. Respect their system and adapt to it. Be flexible. Ch you know, try to figure it out. It's, uh, it's not hard as long as you're aware of it, as long as you're looking for it. So you're a developer first, animator second. That's the hardest thing. Um, it took me a while for me to understand it. I, I thought, I'm an animator. I am 100% animator. But if you're working in a video game environment, um, you're an animator second. You are a support uh, figure, just like everyone else, to uh, create the um, ultimate product, which is a game, which is an interactive one. Uh, so we're making um, animation for games, not games for animation. It's an interactive experience. It's very important to understand how your animation fits in the overall context of the game. As a developer, you'll be molding your animations for feel, uh, timing, distance, and interactivity based on how it looks in-game, not in Maya, but in-game is, is the key factor in games. Um, <clears throat> which your animations will, uh, believe it or not, actually look and feel totally different from uh, what's in Maya and what it turns into, what it sort of becomes in the game with all the, uh, once it fits in the context, once in, in, the, um, in front of a particular angle of a camera, the lighting, special effects, it just pr pretty much transforms your animations into something different and you need to um, uh, treat it like so. Um, so let's, let's take a, um, an example. Say uh, one of the designers, um, uh, one of your leads are asking you to uh, create a punch animation for, for your game. Um, so, so what do you do? So someone, someone's asking, a producer's asking you this. Uh, the, first, uh, the first thing you do in a nutshell is talk to your designer and programmer. So they're the people who are uh, coming up with the, the nuts and bolts and how all, all your animations, special effects, sound, uh, you know, how they're going to, basically they're the, uh, the gatekeepers to putting all these puzzle pieces together. So, so talk to them first. Uh, for animation-wise, quickly block out your attack animation. It, you don't want to polish it. You don't want to make it pretty. Uh, you don't want to do some grand um, thing, not just yet. And then put it, put it in, in the game. Throw it in the game as soon as you can in order to assess the timing, distance, feel, and, and interactivity. Then show your work in progress to your designer and decide on a clearer direction. Because once it's in the game, that original idea may be a little bit different. Maybe um, a better idea is idea B, whatever that is. Then start iterating and polishing towards that new direction. So working in a collaborative environment. So working in the game, game industry is a very collaborative environment. You can look at game development like building a Rube, Rube Goldberg machine. Everyone has to work in sync with each other to make this contraption run well. So problem solving is a super important skill to learn. In this evolving, ever-changing, breaking contraption like a Rube Goldberg machine. So, so how do you become a, a good problem solver? So the more you understand the machine and how designers and programmers are using your animations, the better, the better you'll be able to communicate and help solve problems. It's part of game development for things to go out of sync and break. It's normal. Be flexible, roll with the punches, and practice active listening. So here's my, some of my um, old animations. Just want to just uh, touch upon this. Uh, at the time, this is PlayStation 2. Um, 
And I thought it was um, an innovative uh, thing for me to really push. The inspiration of Jack and Daxter for me was uh, Aladdin and Abu. So it's a classic animation which I loved, and I try to put that sort of uh, elasticity and that uh, cartooniness to Jack and Daxter. So I try to push it as much as I can. So the squash and stretch is pretty ridiculous, pretty crazy, and uh, the stretch is supposed to be felt, uh, not seen, but I kind of hit it at that breaking point and, and making it still look uh, appealing. So, and also, on top of that, uh, working with uh, the programmer, Andy Gavin from, from Naughty Dog back in the day, uh, we really um, stressed the detail on transition, uh, fluidity of blending uh, from one uh, moveset to the other. Nowadays, that's, that's normal. If you don't do that, your animation's no good. Uh, back then, you know, we felt that we're innovating. We felt that just being that critical to detail was, was uh, something no one really had tried at that level. So, uh, so it, was, it was a pretty fun time exploring, uh, polishing this uh, moveset. Uh, Uncharted. So, uh, so previously, just to go back, so this is a third person character. This is the difference, um, the, the unique thing about this is the animation is tied to your control. So it's a one to one mapping. Um, the iteration is very quick because if you move forward, the character moves forward. If you press uh, jump on, the, pre uh, the character jumps. And you pretty much um, have it all mapped out on your control and you can see the results right away. So on the opposite spectrum, when you're working with um, artificial intelligence or enemy characters, um, you create animation movesets for them, but you are, uh, you're giving up the control to AI, uh, AI. So the better you, understand, uh, better you understand the AI behavior and, and its limits, uh, the better you can kind of gauge um, how to um, create and modify these animations. Um, so one example, <clears throat> so one example here is um, this is a fa uh, very fast-moving uh, creature. So he's generally moving forward. So so the navigation is is quite simple, and um, and half the time he's going through sort of a quick time event where he just kind of interacts with you and attacks with you when he's within range. So this is more um, uh, sort of like the intermediate difficulty level of working with AI. So, what's, uh, so what is the hard difficulty um, AI? It's uh, when they're human and they walk um, slowly and, and because we know what humans are supposed to act like, because we are humans, I mean, if I'm a soldier and, and I'm in this, this particular combat, so, so here, here's a, on the top right is a bad example. So look at, look at the AI characters. Well, you know, I created a you know, bunch of animations, um, for it, but the AI is using it very, very poorly. Uh, the AI is not looking at the player. The AI is going backwards. Um, they're not really talking to each other. They're just really, really dumb. So, so these are the things that you have to work with um, and collaborate with the programmers and designers to make them look not dumb. Um, and, um, and, and so, so on the, the bottom right, it's a little bit better where there's, there's sort of like a, uh, pirates, uh, they're a little, you know, scampering around, and one guy's uh, sort of, you know, doing a gangster-style move to kind of uh, move from point A to point B. So this is a semi-successful, um, believable behavior of these uh, pirates you're interacting with. Uh, but there's, uh, because they're human, it's, it's quite, quite uh, difficult, and you're working with uh, sort of a disconnect with when the AI will choose to play your animations. So it's quite challenging. So raw data, working in VR. Um, so what's, uh, what's different in working in VR versus working in 3D, uh, just, just regular 3D? Um, oops, one second. So VR is, highly, um, is a highly immersive environment, as you guys know. Um, to control your the character, which, which is you, the movement of the body dictates your player control. So it's not, it's, it's not tied to control a little D-pads or joysticks anymore. So if you physically move forward, your character moves forward. If your arm moves, your character's arm um, is moving. Um, 
the enemy, um, for example, on the bottom left, the enemy's AI's punch is designed to be within um, arm's reach of your physical self. So when they interact with you, it's, it's designed so that you can actually punch it. You can counter punch his, um, his punch that he's about to throw. So the anticipation is quite long to give the player an opportunity to punch it. Versus a traditional way to design this punch, uh, if I were to do it on a third person uh, environment, he would actually lean uh, back. A traditional, you, you lunge back with on, on the opposite leg, and then you wind up and you pretty much uh, throw your body forward. In this case, he has to kind of, kind of rotate or um, pivot uh, almost in place. So these are very carefully designed uh, choices. And the iteration on this was, uh, I would say, at least 20, 30 times until we dialed it in perfectly, including where the fist lands um, near or right in front of the camera. So it's seemingly a simple animation, but working in game, dev um, game environment and working with designers, we really had to uh, dial this in to be precise. So this is another example of, a <clears throat> of an attack. So, so a, lot of, a lot of you guys are maybe practicing a three-hit combo. Um, so a lot of three-hit combos that you guys might be um, aware of is uh, three-hit combos that actually uh, progress forward. There's a lot of m m uh, movement uh, that goes, um, it, it may cover maybe uh, 10 meters or they may jump um, 20 feet high and land uh, somewhere else. Um, so in, in VR, uh, we want to be careful with that. We want to, uh, because it's such an immersive environment, we want to take that three-hit combo and pretty much surround, uh, pretty much be localized around the uh, character's uh, viewing area. <clears throat> Another note in VR, some of the experiences I had, because it's immersive, uh, things need to be, animation needs to be uh, clearer and slow down for readability. So there's many times when um, animation I thought in Maya was, uh, was perfectly timed right. Uh, it, looks, it looks great, it looks appealing, um, but in this, in this case of this, uh, this object here, it was, uh, at first, it was actually moving really, really fast. So just the fact that you are in this 3D environment, you, you, you pretty much have a um, sense overload. Uh, because you have your sense overload, you need to uh, just give a hum the human that's watching this uh, crazy 3D uh, virtual reality um, effect that's happening around him to be uh, digestible, readable, um, and um, ultimately, um, ultimately for readability. Um, so that's, those are a couple of notes on on VR. All right, and um, <clears throat> so so lastly. Um, I encourage you guys to innovate. Uh, do something that's different. Um, think outside the box. Contribute to the animation community in a unique way. Um, so you guys, you guys have great ideas. You guys will come up with something. Either it's an innovative idea for, for games or innovative idea for learning or what have you. So I would say keep on uh, pushing forward. Uh, for me personally, uh, the one thing that I worked on, per, um, uh, that I innovated, uh, that I thought was um, uh, basically my pet project was called Rhino House. Um, it's a resource for animators and animation teachers. Uh, essentially offers video reference um, and a unique online video player uh, to view them. <laughs> so stay motivated, stay inspired, uh, keep moving forward and be humble. That's all. Okay. So I'm going to talk about, um, you know, game VFX in general and also specifically at Servios. Um, and first I wanted to give a little, like, technical, you know, terminology note that I think, just so no one's confused, like, um, the word, or the abbreviation, like, VFX, 
when, you, when you're talking about film, they use that as like a big general umbrella for all these different parts like modeling, lighting, animation. But then in games, when you talk about VFX, it's just specifically making like um, effects work like explosions and that kind of thing. So, and then that kind of corresponds to in like the VFX film world to what you would call like an uh, effects or a effects artist. So just, uh, so, so that's just so that my terminology makes sense to everyone. So um, a little bit of, about me. So I, I studied visual effects at SCAD, uh, Savannah College of Art and Design. And that was a program, you know, focused on, you know, film and TV visual effects. And so that was my kind of background. And then I worked on a, as a, an effects artist on some CG animated films at DreamWorks Animation, um, like The Crudes and Kung Fu Panda 3, a few others. Um, but then, you know, after that, I kind of wanted to do something different, so I transitioned to real time um, VFX work. And, you know, luckily I knew someone who was working at Oculus Story Studio, and I got like a contract job there for a while. Um, and then after that, I came here at, at Servios and, you know, having a really great time here. Um, so anyway, so what am I going to talk about, you know? So first, what is VFX? You know, real-time VFX versus pre-rendered VFX, since I have kind of like a knowledge of both of them. And then what kind of tasks does a, you know, game VFX artist do? How do you design your effects? What are the unique challenges in VR? And what are some basic principles of optimization? So what is VFX? It's kind of like, I, probably since you're all like Noman students, you, know, you have a pretty good idea of what it is, but like maybe, I, I was actually looking this up and I couldn't find like a really good technical definition for it, you know. But I, I have some examples and I try to make it my own um, definition. So here's an, like an example of, um, some VFX we have on raw data where there's like a screen effect and effects on the hands and, you know, a punch effect. Um, here's an, an, another example from raw data. Uh, Kevin Anderson did these really cool raindrops in the background and then I worked on this explosion uh, which is used for one of the characters' grenades. And this also shows like a cool dichotomy between um, effects can be very simple and uh, subtle like the raindrops or they can be very like flashy and obvious. And then this is another thing which I would consider like VFX, even though it doesn't use particle systems, you know, it's just a material on something, but it's actually animated and it, it's conveying, you know, a sense of energy. So, you know, I, I think it qualifies. Um, and then these are some uh, VFX done by uh, Nathan Hong, who's a, a Noman graduate. <laughs> He's right over there. So I just thought it'd be cool to show some of the stuff he was working on. Um, also, yeah, these things too. Uh, anyway, so what is my definition for VFX? It's kind of like the animation or simulation of special elements, and by special I mean it's usually non-character elements, and it's often based around like energy or physical forces. Um, because like, you know, generally when you think about animation, you're thinking about like, uh, you know, character animation, but there's a lot of other things in the world that, you know, move around, and a lot of them are kind of like, complicated to just like keyframe by hand. So that's kind of where I think like a, a visual effects artist comes in is how to make that stuff happen. So some examples are explosions, fire, rain, water splashes, and abstract things like force fields, holograms, and magic spells. And so then like, what's the difference between like pre-rendered, you know, film and TV VFX or, or effects? Um, and what's the, and real time, effects on like games or VR presentation, uh, VR experiences. Um, and you, you might think these are, are kind of similar and some of the skill sets are shared, but that's actually a big difference to them. And I know, cause like I trans transitioned from, you know, film VFX to games. So you have to kind of like relearn how to do a bunch of things. And to kind of like break it down into some simple terminology, like when you're working on pre-rendered film stuff, you're worried about um, how many hours does it take to render something, or sometimes even how many days does it take, you know, how long is the simulation gonna take in terms of like minutes or hours. But when you're working on games, the biggest, you know, time uh, increment you're worried about is milliseconds, which is a thousandth of a second, because you will only have, you know, maybe in VR, like 11 milliseconds for the GPU to calculate, you know, the, the data it shows on the screen. 
and then in VFX, you only get a small part of that. You might get like four milliseconds, so you have to like actually keep track of that number and make sure you don't go over. And then um, another difference is in film, you're producing frames. So when I worked at DreamWorks, I would just what I would deliver at the end of the day would be an image sequence, a, a sequence of images. And um, the nice thing about that is then you can go in and like paint and roto and you know clean it up however you want. But the downside is that you've just created a static thing that's always going to be exactly the same. Whereas like in, in real time, you know, you're producing systems and you need to think about it that way. So like you need to view the you know effects system you built from like different angles, different distances, test it out in different ways to make sure that it actually works correctly in all those different ways. And, and the cool part is you get to you know, actually see it in a bunch of different ways. Um, in terms of like complexity, when you're working on like film stuff, you're talking about like millions of particles and you have data caches that are like gigabytes per frame or something. And you can do that in, you know, for games if you're just generating like flipbook elements, but when you're talking about actual in game stuff, you're only talking about maybe a few hundred particles, maybe like a, a few thousand at most. And it requires a different approach because you know, you, instead of having to create an effect with like a million particles, you have to think, okay, how can I scale this down and communicate the same thing but only with like a hundred particles? Um, and kind of to sum it all up, you know, in, in film and, and TV, I think the biggest thing you're focused on is like quality. Whereas in games, you also really focus on quality, but you have to make sure that performance is like your number one priority. Um, and so, why should you be a real-time VFX artist? You know, maybe you're kind of thinking about both of them, and you know, you want to know which direction to go. In, and I'm gonna <laughs> try to convince you this direction. So, um, one of the cool things is you can work on video games. You know, which is you know, some, I, personally, I kind of like video games more than I do m movies, so that appealed to me. Um, another thing is I think, like, real-time VFX is like a growing field, you know, as games get bigger, they, um, the people in them can become more specialized, and, you know, there's more, like, ready, ready accessible game technology now with, like, Unreal Engine and Unity. And I think with VR, it's just going to spread out into, you know, there's going to be a bunch of games in VR and then a wide range of, like, uh, non-gaming uh, technology eventually. Um, an another cool thing is that, from what I've seen, like in um, games, the jobs are more spread out. Like if you're talking about film VFX, it's usually only in a few hub cities, you know. So maybe that appeals to you. Um, an another thing is like, you know, even though, you know, some of the stuff you see in, in real-time VFX might not look, you might not have, you know, a million particles, it can still be just as technically challenging you know, as anything you'll, you'll do in film, and because you have to actually optimize it, and you can't take sh shortcuts, you know, or just lazy hacks. You have to make sure everything works well. And then one of the final really cool things is that you can actually, like, if you're working in real time, and you've made this, like, real time um, dynamic system, you can actually, like, like I said, experience it from multiple elements, and if you're working in VR, you can actually, like, be in the presence of something you've created, which for me as an artist is a really powerful thing. Um, and so, just another general overview. I mean, some of this is kind of general, but I just think it's interesting to go through this. So, what kind of tasks does a VFX artist do? You know, you set up particle systems, you can paint textures, you can create shaders um, in Unreal or Unity. You know, you can run simulations. You know, in terms of um, different types of simulations uh, that you might either render or like bring into the game as some kind of animated mesh. And then you can render flipbooks that you use in a, in a particle system. And sometimes, you know, I think it's useful to have some kind of like scripting knowledge because you might, like Justin was saying, you know, especially in small teams, you have to wear many hats and implement, you know, what you create. Um, and to briefly talk about VFX design, because I think this is actually like, you know, when you compare it to film, the, the design in, uh, in games has different criteria. You have to, because game is interactive, I think your first concern is communication. So when you, um, if you have like a grenade effect and it's creating an explosion, you want that grenade to communicate that it's deadly and damaging and you want it to communicate exactly what is the radius of that effect because then the player knows you know, how, how the game uh, element works. Uh, another thing I think that's cool is like 
games are about satisfaction. So the player will pull a trigger and then they'll see an explosion and that, you know, will, for a lot of people will make them feel good. So you want your effect to be like flashy and, and give that kind of like feedback, kind of like if you, if you're pulling a slot machine and you get like, you know, three things in a row, it's going to light up and flash and that's, you know, the same kind of like visual stimulus. Um, the other thing to think about is like style, you know, does the effect match the game's art style and does it, you know, look good and hold up the same quality standard as, as the game. Um, so in terms of like at Servios, you know, what's different about Servios, how does our VFX department work? We have about three FX artists right now and we're working on different projects. Um, we, have, we really have a very small team but we're also trying to produce, you know, high quality stuff. So we have to be very strategic in what we do. Uh, first and for foremost, we always want to check what we're doing in VR, like as we're creating it. That's why, um, you know, uh, I have an Oculus Rift on my desk, so I can just like put it on, see what the thing looks like, and then take it off. Because, especially I think in VFX, things look completely different in VR than they do in in, in, two, in 2D. Um, like Justin said, you know. People here wear many hats. You have to be self-sufficient. And another thing for VFX is, you know, since we're a small team, we want to keep things simple, but also keep it like clean and polished. And a big thing is to like reuse elements. And especially in games, I think, you know, instead of just creating something for the one effect you're working on, you might think, okay, I'm creating some fire. How can I use this fire in like ten different effects I'm going to be creating later? Because that'll save you time and reduce the you know, footprint of your game on disk and on memory. Um, talk a little bit about uh, VR and what's different about it. Uh, the biggest thing I think is that 90 frames per second, you know, can be demanding. You only have 11 milliseconds, so you have to be careful about, you know, how many things you use and always be checking performance. Um, another thing is like most game VFX is made using particle systems with sprites, but unfortunately sprites can look very flat and in VR and it just takes you out of the experience. So you want to find ways to work around that. Um, but on the plus side, you know, 3D elements like meshes and then if you have a bunch of small particles that fill a volume, that will look very cool in VR, like way cooler than it does in, in, in 2D. So you need to play to the strengths of the medium. Um, and this is showing off some techniques for how to like fake depth. So this is the same explosion I was showing before in the, in the rainy scene. This is a single frame from it. And I've, you know, projected it onto a 3D mesh so that it actually has some amount of depth. You know, you, you can kind of tell that it's a thin thing, but since it's not perfectly flat, it doesn't bother your eye as much as it, as it otherwise would. Um, and here's an example of what this mesh can look like. Another thing is uh, parallax mapping. So this, um, this lens flare here is actually just a single card, you know, a single polygon. Um, but because it's using this technique called parallax mapping where it kind of offsets the texture lookup based on the angle that you're viewing it at, as you look at the thing, it looks like it has depth and like that, you know, you're seeing this volumetric thing going on. So that, that's a very good effect that you, that you know, if you're using Unreal, look into the bump offset node and, and use that thing. Um, and then this point on like optimization. Um, so like optimization is like a very important thing for like a VFX artist because if you don't, you know, watch out for it, you can just tank the frame rate and then, you know, if you start dropping frames, especially in VR, it makes people like uncomfortable. So you, you have to watch out for this. Um, so one of the biggest concerns is overdraw in VFX. And what that is, is if you have like a particle system and you have um, multiple, you know, particles on top of each, each other, the shader cost is cum cumulative, you know, throughout the whole stack of them. And that slows down the GPU. So what you want to do is like spread your particles out or use less particles so they don't overlap. Um, another thing is, you know, you want to make sure you're testing things in like real world conditions. So you don't just want to test within the Unreal Engine and the editor. You actually want to boot up the game um, in, uh, in kind of like a, as, as someone would actually play it and then see what the frame, frame rate is then. 
Um, in addition to that, you want to verify that the stats that you're getting are actually accurate because, for example, like the Unreal Engine has a shader complexity view mode that shows you like a color coded view mode of, you know, how, um, how expensive the scene is and it'll show green for good and red for bad. But certain types of techniques don't actually work with that as accurately as you would think, especially like mass materials uh, when you're using MSAA. So like you can wind up with having something that looks really green, but it's actually just as expensive as something else that looks like, you know, really exp like red and white and really expensive. So you, if you're using these kind of like useful tools, you always want to at some point double check that they're feeding you good information. And then finally, I think it's important to like understand the graphics pipeline. Um, you don't have to know everything and you can just start slowly, but just read up on a little bit on how GPUs work, how they like pass data from the computer to the GPU. You don't need to know it like the way a programmer does. You just need to know it at a very abstract level so you have an idea of what's a, a fast thing for the GPU and what's a slow thing for the GPU to do. So what kind of like skills can you work on to become an effects artist? Um, I think it's very important to balance your like technical and artistic skills. You, you'll probably find like one area where you excel in, but you want to make sure that in the other area you're still like bringing up your skills and, and working on that. Because like as an effects artist you have to deal with both of them and, and it just won't come to get together unless you're, you're doing both. Um, the next thing is like learn a game engine. I would suggest Unreal because it's the easiest one to just get in there and start like, you know, making things happen without having to, uh, like Unity is also an option but it takes a little bit more work to get the graphics up to the, to the level you need. Um, and then, I mean, this, this, maybe this is kind of basic but like learn, you know, uh, 3D programs in terms of how to make, you know, like flip books of things in Maya, Houdini, or 3ds Max and a big thing is to study like effects in, you know, games, film, animation and especially real life because, um, you know, it's always good to go back and find like a, re like if you're doing an explosion, go look up online and find videos of like actual ex explosions to see what they look like and it'll, it'll give you new ideas maybe and allow you to, you know, have your own unique spin on something. Um, you know, I think it's also a good idea to like at least try learning some kind of programming or scripting like blueprints, C Sharp or maybe Python. And it, it's not something that everyone, you know, cl clicks with them, but I think it's at least good to try. You know, you, you never really know unless you try. Like I didn't uh, start getting into like any kind of technical scripting stuff until kind of later than a lot of other people, but you know, I found out it actually clicked with me and I was able to make it work. Um, and then another point is networking, you know, it's a, that's a very important thing and uh, <laughs> I don't really have any great tips for it but you just have to go out and talk to people. Uh, and the final thing is like, I think especially as an effects artist you, have, you can't be afraid of like trying new things because there's are always new technologies coming out and it's, in this industry you'll probably have to like reinvent yourself at some point, you know, and, and try something new or, or find out some new way to do things. So um, there's been a bunch of points in my life when I've been hesitant about something. Like at first I didn't know if I really wanted to focus on like effects. I was like, well, I'm, I'm not sure if I, if I can really handle that. But then I, you know, I gave it a shot and I found that I was good at it and I enjoyed it. And then later on um, I was like, when I was a, a film, you know, VFX artist, I, I wasn't really sure about transi transitioning into real time effects because I thought I was going to have to, you know, climb up a mountain. Uh, like, and an, I was already climbing a mountain and have to climb a new one. Um, but, you know, I gave it a shot. I stuck with it and, you know, I made it work. And it, it you know, it works out if you, if you can put the time into it and, and make things happen. Um, so to, summary, to summarize what I, what I was talking about, um, VFX is kind of like the animation of energy. That's, I think, the simplest definition. Um, Real-time effects involves creating systems as opposed to just frames. Uh, VFX artists use a wide range of tools and it's good to like, learn a bunch of different workflows. 
Uh, VFX design is about communication, satisfaction, and style. And VFX for VR, it presents a ton of new challenges and opportunities. And so I think it's a really great time to start investigating that if you're a student. Um, and finally, like optimization, <laughs> it's, always, it's, it's always essential. So um, that's kind of my presentation. Thank yeah. you guys for being here. <laughs> right, okay. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Hi, Kevin Wilson, Senior Environment Artist at Service. Um, I'm going to quickly run through a background of myself, what I've done, um, show you some of my work um, so you know what I'm about, uh, the kind of things I like to do professionally and personally. Um, and then going to talk about the um, thought process of doing environment art and creating assets um, and solving a lot of the issues that you might face along the line and in final production of those assets, um, which can be a lot of about thought process, um, reference gathering, um, you know, asset name listing um, and stuff like that. A lot of boring stuff, but a lot of reference gathering. Um, just so it, it kind of helps you to think about the thought process before you actually start production of those assets and how important that is, um, especially when building interactive objects or you know, environment asset kits, which involve a lot of different pieces which might be used together. Um, yeah, so let me run through a bunch of stuff. Um, so my career started uh, when I was uh, in college, uh, about 99, I started using 3D programs. I did product design at college um, back in England. Um, and there wasn't really a lot of um, gaming or VFX uh, classes out there to do that. So it was kind of a different ball game back then to get into the industry as it is now. Um, but um, still, it's you know perseverance and all the rest of it and focusing down on what you want to do and what you're good at. Um, and showing examples of that. So, a bit of background of me. My first games job was in 2002 um, for FIFA uh, World Cup 2002. I don't think I've got any screenshots of that now because it's so old. Um, but I'll run through some of the stuff that I did after that. Uh, predominantly games. I worked a short span in film industry as well for MPC on Harry Potter, Prisoner of Azkaban. Um, I actually preferred the, the production values and the production times of games because films was very, um, can be very stressful and it, the, the contracts are very short-lived. So personally, I prefer sort of longer gestation periods. Um, that's not always the case, but it, it can be. This actual first piece that I did was um, the test that I did for Servius. So they wanted like a science fiction type doorway. Um, it was done in Maya um, and ZBrush and, um, and Unreal. Um, I've had a little dabble in photogrammetry as well, um, scanning for real-time objects. Um, this was done for research uh, for my previous job before service, which is EA uh, Visceral Games over in Redwood Shores. Um, so we were looking into a lot of the photogrammetric stuff and getting sort of hyper-real environment work, um, a little bit of sculpting work, which is not my major strength, but I, you know, I have to try and learn as much of it as possible. Um, some lighting studies, so as an environment artist, um, you know, sometimes I have to d uh, dabble in a lot of the lighting, especially in initial lighting um, for environments, especially for service and smaller companies where I have to lot wear a lot of different hats, you know. Um, perhaps where somewhere, somewhere like EA, um, I would be very much focused down on asset creation um, or world building uh, and managing levels and large multiplayer levels. I generally wouldn't be in charge of the lighting. But I like to stay abreast of lighting. I like to experiment with it. So this was some um, V-Ray renders that I did um, back in the day. Um, I think this was based off another test that I did as well um, for someone. But um, never quite finished it. This is taking a little bit of time. So this is some of the work that I did for Battlefield. This was actually a DLC pack. Um, that I built as a pod lead artist on this. So it was a lot of world building, but also a lot of asset creation as well. Um, 
Yeah, so this is like a multiplayer map for Battlefield, really. So big production. You know, the map took, um, I think, about five months to create from initial sort of um, concepts to the final thing. Um, and I was actually responsible with a, with a bunch of the other guys to come up with the sort of X, which was like a, a one page or a one sheet about what the multiplayer map would be, you know, and the, the visual style of that. Um, one of the major challenges of this map was the snow. Um, we went to and fro between sort of um, shaders that would cover the whole map in, in snow and doing it very much in a, in a technical implementation way. Um, but we actually reverted to a more manual way which we could have control over because there's a lot of things that you don't necessarily think about when you want to put snow in a level, especially if you have interior elements to the, the map and, and things that are covered by our other objects and smaller props that are inside or as opposed to under awnings and stuff. You know, those things don't want to get snow. And if they move, then you don't want snow on the top of something and then it roll over and it's kind of staying. You know, it's always a bit weird. Um, so yeah, these are just some of those screenshots um, of that level. Um, at EA, that's some of the bigger productions that I'd, I'd worked on there. Um, you know, big, big old multiplayer maps, working with a lot of artists, a lot of texture artists. Um, another map from Battlefield. Um, so much Battlefield stuff. <laughs> um, this is some destruction stuff that I did. Um, so. One of the elements was to have different stages of destruction for this wall, um, and that was kind of modeling that out. Um, and the same with this guy as well. Um, just a lot of modeling and texturing on that. Um, some more just asset creation. This is some stuff that I did for EA, um, need for speed stuff. I didn't actually build the whole car, but I um, did a lot of the body work and the front work. So all the, the aftermarket type parts um, I did for that. So I had a, a small stint of vehicle modeling at EA, uh, and that's that thing in, in game, that's that dodge uh, in game. No, it's not a dodge, is it? It's a Mustang. <laughs> uh, <laughs> whoops, showing my Britishness there. Um, it's American, yeah. American. Um, more photogrammetry, playing around with that a while ago. Um, it was more relevant in my previous job, it's not so rele relevant now. Um, some life drawing, I um, always like to keep abreast of my traditional stuff, so it's always, I encourage anyone um, that's looking for work or whatever and is an artist, whatever, you, whatever you, uh, discipline you might do is to, you know, try and sketch as much as you can. You know, it's always nice to see people that have a little bit of um, um, traditional work to back that up. Um, just need for speed stuff, more EA stuff, um, generally world building and all that sort of stuff. Obviously. These screenshots aren't just my work. You know, there's a massive team that goes into building a lot of this, um, particularly in stuff like this. I was responsible for the road networks there, so um, the road systems and, um, and texturing and shading for those roads. This is very old uh, hard surface stuff, but way before substance and all that sort of stuff where you had to um, paint your edge wear and, and all that sort of stuff manually and create your textures in Photoshop, um, which is a real ball like. Um, yeah, just more lighting studies, um, some sketching in mind for the environment stuff. So, um, looking at what kind of um, modularity that I wanted out of a warehouse kit. Um, so, build, you know, sketching some different warehouses and then looking at a lot of reference and, um, um, you know, trying to figure out how to get as much bang for buck out of the, out of the same general shape of warehouse, but by only adding. And, and taking off different panels and adding sort of set dressing and stuff. A lot of this is about silhouette, and that was a big part of to make these warehouses distinctive. You know, that's what learn, that's how sketching uh, taught me to learn that about what I wanted out of the asset kit and stuff. Um, this is PlayStation Home stuff. So um, I had a um, background in product design, so I used to do a lot of sketching and a lot of furniture design. Um, uh, and we had to bi build out a lot of furniture for the, the, um, the users to buy and populate their um, virtual apartments with. Um, so yeah, we had to create a lot of that stuff. Uh, and it all had to be original as well, so um, we couldn't just steal designs. Oh, I mean, you, you can do a little bit, but it's still your own design type thing. Um, and that's some of that stuff um, built out. 
Um, I think this is actually rendered in V-Ray, but um, and this was the, like the vanilla set of furniture you would get at PlayStation Home. Um, the very optimized stuff that is actually because that was PS3. Uh, more PlayStation Home stuff, um, more sketching, um, and that was a concept I did for the previous environment. Um, so yeah, just generally that's a background of what I what I do. I don't think there's much else. There's a, I, there's a bunch of different stuff that I've done with um, more Need for Speed stuff there. Um, some look dev stuff I did for EA. Um, we were doing a lot of PBR into integration, so we were learning how to do PBR with pre-rendered stuff, um, foliage and other pieces and bits and pieces. But you can go and have a look at that. A little bit of my, my history, I used to do um, Warhammer, paint Warhammer miniatures when I was young. Uh, that's an example of that. Um, Citadel miniatures, they used to call it back then. Um, yeah, and just product visuals, so yeah, that's a little bit about that. Um, so what I'll run through now is, uh, ironically, um, I'm going to talk a lot about the thought process and, and pre-production and organizing yourself and trying to foresee a lot of the things that you might need to create um, uh, and how that will help you with naming conventions and, and organizing yourself and not stumbling over yourself uh, by making things with a, with a short-sighted sort of sense. Um, so what, one of the raw data which you've seen the, the, um, the trailer of there, it's very much like a, a hard sci-fi type game. Um, but actually, the last level that we wanted to create, we wanted to inject a little bit more organic stuff. So we decided to go for um, a, a Japanese botanical gardens type environment. Um, uh, which was still set in a sci-fi kind of environment, so it still had elements of sci-fi in it, but it's, it was very much organic, very sort of zen-like look. Um, so I'll show you a couple of um, screens of the final, the final version of that. Um, let's full screen that. So it's very different to the sort of sci-fi environments that we showed before in the trailer. Um, and it, we, were, we were very, we were, you know, we wanted to be ambitious with what we created in uh, in our last level, uh, but we also had time constraints, um, and we always have to work with designers to, um, you know, iterate on the design, um, and that's the struggle between environment work, layout, and design, where you all always want to keep your um, your work flexible. So if there is change, you know, drastic changes to the layout of a map, um, you know, you can reuse and replace that stuff uh, without much rework. So there's, there's not a lot of bespoke work here. It's all, you know, for instance, the, the building is built out of a modular kit. Um, you know, the rest, the rest of the set dressing here is, is plug and play, you know, you just sort of uh, pieces that the designers can like, move around and stuff. Um, yeah. Uh, had a lot of help from Rodrigo down here, which is the uh, alumni guy, did a lot of the foliage and helped me out with a lot of the environment pieces. Um, yeah, and the Zen lines in the sand, which was a little trick we came up with, which is quite quite ingenious. Um, to get that sort of bespoke look um, and to kind of um, break the, the monotony of a, like a really flat, ground gravel because you know although there's that detail in there you can see the gravel detail um, when that starts to mip out when that starts to blur out when you get in the distance um, it's basically just beige you know so you have to kind of think about these things and try and solve those visual problems um, more of the elements in here no, another one of Rodrigo's assets which is the um, um, the, the sort of exposed generator type thing and this is this is an interactive object where you're, you're going down the tram uh, and you're stood on the tram and to avoid getting hurt by the, um, the, the laser force field or laser gates, um, you can blow up these, um, these generators by the exposed illuminate, illuminating parts. Um, yeah. So a lot of those objects you know, have to be thought about and have to go through a... Um, uh, a sort of design um, layout and, and proxy stage where you know these these objects will stay um, in proxy form or, or ray box form or whatever for quite a long time until they're absolutely 
nailed by, you know, absolutely nailed the gameplay, their positioning, you know, the, the sort of radius of them and how high the, the interactable part is and stuff like that. So it's, it's quite easy to sort of take a piece of concept work and say, oh, we need this interactable object um, and then just go straight in and build this thing out in substance and it's all looking beautiful and then you get it in game and it's like, it's the wrong size or it's, you know, this, this interactive piece needs to be halfway down which will completely break all your UVs and your texturing and all the rest of it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, that's what I'm going to talk about in a moment. It's about foreseeing those problems and, uh, and trying to stay within the realms of um, proxy and grey box for as long as possible. Um, and iterating on your work. Um, so yeah, so that's that environment. So um, starting off with an environment like this is quite an undertaking. So you know, we, we've, got, we've got a lot of idea about the premise of the environment, which is a botanical gardens. It's like a Zen garden type thing. Um, so the first thing we'd look at um, is for me, it will be just starting a Pinterest page. So you know, I, whenever I'm building an environment or building any kind of asset, I really want to immerse myself in as much visual stimuli as possible. So what I want to try and say about a lot of the, my thought process and, and what is a good um, tool to have and not to be scared of it is to spend a lot of time thinking about something and, and thinking about stuff. And it's, it's okay to just... Sometimes it may seem like you're not being productive, but you are because you're, you're thinking about stuff. And that's, that might save you time down, uh, down the line or it may add to the visual fidelity of something. So you probably see a lot of um, sil similar elements in this um, Pinterest board as you see in the level. Um, and this is a vast board, you know. I'm, I'm really sort of... Um, I'm not going to go through each individual picture because it's, there's just so much and there's a lot about um, the anatomy of objects, especially naturally formed objects like trees and bamboo, you know, I'm, I'm figuring out how these things are made and how they're going to, uh, you know, how I'm going to build them and how I, I can make them look as convincing as possible. Um, yeah, a lot of sort of architectural inspiration, still looking at a lot of modern stuff. Um, so much uh, rock reference, <laughs> it's crazy. We had to build a lot of rocks for this environment, so um, yeah. A lot of vegetation, Japanese maples, which we never actually used in the end, but that was a, a thing that we might have done. Um, the stone lanterns and stuff, more and more bamboo. <laughs> um, architectural elements. There was at one point we were going to build like a dojo type section, so we were thinking about building a dojo kit. So it's uh, had to do a lot of um, thought into um, how these buildings are actually built. You know how how the the carpentry and the engineering goes into these things. You never can go to the full extent of building them out exactly as they're as they're built in real life, but you need to um, you need to sort of suspend disbelief, as it were. Um, yeah, so that's, that's a lot of this stuff was built over the, the period of the project as well. So, you know, there's absolutely tons of this stuff, but it, it really did help me looking back um, whenever I needed to, to, to gather reference. And I always force myself to go back and look at reference and, and never go too far um, into a tunneled vision that's just purely in my head. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that's a lot of the, the Pinterest stuff covered. Now, while I'm doing that and while we're um, blocking out the level, um, I'm also thinking about um, making a list of assets. So even before I start building, um, building a level, um, I would be thinking about um, specifically what kind, of build, what kind of assets that I'm going to need for it, what kind of props... What, what kind of set dressing am I going to need? Um, if there's an architectural kit, starting to figure out just on paper first what kind of modular pieces that I need for that building to get it built. Um, just so I sort of get an idea of, and that, of how many assets I'm going to need. And that's also good um, for insight into production as well. Um, uh, you know, because it, it starts to, these asset lists start to 
creep up and build very quickly. And when they do start to get really massive, you know you have to start scoping things down a little bit um, and probably simplifying things a lot. So that's another tool that I like to use. You know, this is just like um, Google Sheets. And I, I, this, this asset list is very interactive and very sort of established. But when it started off, it was just, you know, 20 lines of me sketching out um, asset names and stuff like that. Um, and it also helps with um, naming conventions and stuff, which is very boring, but it's also very important. Um, organization is, is a key to sort of um, collaborative work and making things easy, not just in the short term, but in, um, in the long term. Um, so yeah, let me show you some concepts, that, like initial concepts of this um, botanical gardens environment. So we have a um, DXL concept artist along with um, Hardy, who did a lot of great stuff. A lot of quick concepts, you know, not really um, getting too bogged down in being perfect or being, um, you know, being absolutely like this is the final thing. Because, you know, a lot of times in development, um, you'll throw away a lot of stuff. So it's, it's always good not to be precious about things. Um, so we had this idea of the dome and stuff very early on. We wanted to... Um, portray this idea of that this is a, a natural environment, but it still remains in uh, an artificial space. So it's like a exterior, interior type play, and the dome is actually just a project, projected um, sky dome kind of thing. Um, so more quick sketches from DX, um, helping me sort of identify what kind of assets that I need um, to build and the visual style and stuff like that. This came on. This came later on in the production, actually. So, you know, even halfway through the production of the level, we're still getting concept work coming back, um, and it's very much like a to and fro type thing. Um, and it gives me a lot of good idea about um, still what kind of assets that I need to produce. Um, and this is a great example of that. And this is very rich in its diversity of assets. And that was one thing that we learned. It was like, actually, you know, we can't have that amount of stuff. It looks fantastic and we want that amount of stuff, but how do we get that sort of richness of look with uh, a limited amount of assets? Um, so it's really sort of just like leaning on what you've got and trying to make what, what you've got as visually appealing as possible. Um, quick map layouts, you know, getting an idea of how the map's going to be laid out some architectural designs which saw its way into the final thing you know a lot of the a lot of the buildings I, the, the the kits that I initially built out were actually quite visually boring um, so Hardy had, had pulled up a lot of um, great concepts um, with some asymmetry and, and better angles so we then integrated that kind of stuff into the the, the modular kit and it, and that's another proof in the pudding about not going to the full final artwork before you're really sure about it because the, luckily the kit for this was still in proxy form. It, it, gone, it had some modeling detail put into it, but it hadn't gone all the way to the texturing phase. So, you know, adding details like this was actually quite easy and it didn't really, um, uh, you know, give us a lot of rework or make us have a lot of rework for the stuff that had already been done. So I keep minimizing that for some reason. Um, and then just like taking, you know, thought processes and taking pictures of uh, meetings, sketching out stuff. So this is a lot of sketches that we do with the designers um, and the art director. Um, yeah, and this is where like a lot of the, the juices for, you know, figuring out what's going on and the interaction, the timing and, you know, spaces for the level, more whiteboard sketches. So we do that quite a lot, you know, we'll all sit down at a whiteboard, sketch it out, and then we'll, we'll take a picture of it and, and stick it in email and, and, and email it out. Um, this is the tram concept, so that was quite a late concept for the tram, quite a developed concept. Started out fairly early um, with Hardy doing some sort of 3D concepts for it and rendering them out. Um, and you can see pretty much all of those elements making it into the final, final game. Um, and some more sort of more storyline-based um, interact, interaction um, and narrative-based sort of concepts that are, are, are further along where we're thinking about, you know, what's the narrative for these things and how does it make you feel when you're passing through these spaces. Um, 
So yeah, and then I'll just take you through um, quite a few um, screenshots of the, the whole development process. So we have a review process which we review um, stuff along the way. So you know, when it first started out, um, I built a very simple kit, um, which very sort of rectilinear kit for this um, modern like Watson Genomics building that we wanted to create. Um, we started to get an idea about lighting and environment and stuff like that, um, and what kind of other buildings that we could, we could create from this kit. Um, so yeah, it's quite a, trying to build stuff out that's flexible and that can be changed um, all the time because you never know what you know. With, when you're working with designers, it's always about the final product and the final sort of fun factor in that uh, game or, or map or level. So. You're, you're almost a slave to that, and you have to be, you know, and you have to not be too precious about stuff and understand that you will have to iterate um, and you will have to redo stuff, um, yeah, and try not to get too um, uh, demoralized by that. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, so a lot of the architectural sort of um, exploration. And then we also knew that we needed um, a tram, and that, that tram would have to go through an environment um, a fairly tunnel based environment and how can we make that um, make some sort of um, some cliffs and uh, and rocky parts around the side of that um, without it being bespoke we didn't want to use the terrain system in Unreal because it was too expensive um, so one thing Unreal does have is, is like a spline based um, model which will repeat a bunch of models along a spline um, so I started to investigate how that might look um, uh, uh, with a repeated uh, cliff section, and then it is clear that you know one section is going to look too re repetitive. Um, so we're building out um, you know four or five different cliff pieces, um, more flat flat ones, and then more sort of cliff-like ones, and then transition pieces that would go into that. Um, and that was that was a very flexible way of um, creating this sort of tunnel-like um, environment whilst still being able to actually change those spline points in editor at any point down the production line. So if we wanted to change the shape of the track, or and I think there's some, um, yeah, I'll, I'll say that for later, but if there's any point we want to change the shape of the track or, you know, change the size of the map or anything, which we had to, there was a lot of over scoping there, you know, we were way too ambitious with the size of the map and stuff, so we had to, our initial sort of layout was way too big and we got very scared about how we were going to finish it and stuff, so we, we had to scale that back and, you know, having these flexible type systems um, enabled, enabled us to do that really uh, and not getting bogged down in final artwork too soon. Um, so this is some of the very, very early layout passes that we did for the level. Um, and as you can see from the final screenshots, it looks completely different and, you know, fairly crappy. But that's, that's fine and that's, you, should, you should always be happy or be at ease about things being a little bit crappy for a while, you know, because it takes a long time to make this stuff look amazing. And it's not just you that can make it look amazing, it's everyone and it's the whole you know, it's lighting, it's, it's, the, it's the animation, it's the audio, it's everything. Um, and it all comes together at the end. So this is very much um, the first iterations of that. Very basic, starting to figure out how this, um, the cliff spine will work. Um, starting to get in, blocking in like vegetation and how the bamboo might work. It doesn't have any leaves on it, it's just, you know, it's just the bamboo stalks. A bit of lighting, um, yeah. So that was the f that's the first kind of iteration, and it gets a little bit more in depth. The track, you know, the track piece, which is also on a spline, gets a little bit more love put into it. Um, just still very much in the modeling phase now. You know, it's it's kind of representing the final look of the asset, but we haven't delved into texturing or anything like that yet because we don't want to do that. Because if we do, and it needs to be changed, then there's a lot of wasted work there. Um, and that causes a lot of frustration with artists as well. You know, you don't, never want to scrap artists' work um, because it's demoralizing. Um, so we want to always try and avoid that. Um, yeah, and then very, as you can see, very, very early blockouts of the, of the forecourt uh, in that solder crypt. So these are like the really early stages of that. 
um, and we're just using these, ro uh, you know, brushes in Unreal for the rocks and stuff, because you know I haven't got time to build out the rocks just yet, so they're having to use the des designers are having to use brushes to build that stuff out, and then you know for a little bit further on in the process, um, everything starts to get another level of love to it, another level of detail. So every, we're building everything up at the same time, you know, and we're just generally focus, focusing on the larger. Um, the larger brush strokes in this level. We're not focusing on um, set dressing yet, although there may be artists building props out on, on the side, but they're sort of what I like to call gameplay safe. You know, whatever happens to those objects, they're static objects and they're small and they're never going to really um, affect the production that much. Um, yeah, so everything's sort of building up at the same time. You can start to see that we're getting there. The domes come in, starting to get a bit more feel of the lighting. The lighting's changed. We're going for a more dusky type look. Um, the fog's starting to come in. Um, yeah, more level layout, sort of more assets coming in, like the shrub domes and, and rocks and things. Um, so we're starting to flesh out the level quite a lot. Um, the, the forecourts had a much bigger design pass on it now, and the designers have got hold of a lot more assets so they can kind of flesh it out a little bit better. Um, and then we're also talking with like art directors and stuff about how the building looks, because that's an important aspect to it. It's a, you know, this is like Watson Genomics building. It's the, it's the sort of, um, it's where the, the bad guys have got their main sort of, um, you know, main headquarters or whatever. So you can see what I was talking about earlier about this building, about how rectilinear it is, and it's fairly boring. And at this stage, we're starting to think about, well, how can we, how can we you know, inject a little bit more design into that? Um, and you know, if, if that was built out and it was textured, then I'd be very much pushing back, going, we can't really change it now because I've already textured it and stuff. But because it's still very much in this proxy stage, you know, it's not a problem. We can just add new proxy stuff, you know, spend a day modeling it out. Um, yeah. So very early stages of the trees. I think we purchased some, yeah, these were the old maples that we used. I think we purchased some speed tree stuff and munged them around a little bit and they kind of degraded a little bit. But, you know, they kind of worked and they gave you the, the impression of what we were trying to achieve. Uh, at that stage, it didn't really matter too much. Um, experimenting with how the shrub domes might look and uh, we wanted to get these sort of foliage type things um, while still having like a fluffy look so we're using the foliage system here to um, paint you know leaf cards over the surface the surface of that um, and then they'd lot out really quickly because um, generally you know on, on when you look at those things from afar they're actually just fairly much a solid mass you know um, it's only really when you go up close that you want to see that sort of fuzzy silhouette um, to convince you that it's like a piece of foliage or whatever. Um, yeah. So yeah, at this stage, the, the changes get sort of visually less, but we're honing down on you know design and gameplay. Um, and getting that nailed, so we we feel comfortable going into production with a lot of these assets, um, without you know without um, having to do any uh, rework and wasting time. Yeah, new shapes of the building and stuff. So it's looking a lot more dynamic, and it, that's one of the major benefits from that whole look of the courtyard is that. Um, you know, once our creative di director started having a look at it and started seeing the level and stuff, uh, was very right in saying that that building, you know, didn't have enough punch, and we did have some awesome um, concept work for it. So we just needed to implement a, a couple of little elements for that, and that was really just two, two more bespoke pieces that we added. The rest of it was kind of made the same, and that that's all we needed to sort of sell that really um, super expensive modern building um, yeah so these these domes are like um, um, safe spaces when you're in the gameplay in the courtyard and you're fighting all these enemies um, the, the the globes here um, and the the area around them um, is quite a safe thing so in the final game there's a lot of sort of 
visual effects that go around these trees, a lot of cool lighting um, and set dressing to kind of make you feel safe. Um, yeah. That's an overview. You can see all the holes in the level. It's very much smoke and mirrors. Um, and this is what I was talking about earlier with the track shape. Um, the track shape actually changed quite drastically um, and Justin actually scoped it down quite a lot um, because we realized that we just weren't going to get it completed in time. Um, so it was very big. It was, it was probably about four times the size of this one. Like yeah. <laughs> so we, we started to realize that, well, we started to worry quite a lot, yeah. didn't we, <laughs> about yeah. getting it fixed. Yeah. But, you know, that's, that's a benefit of staying loose um, right up to the end, you know, uh, and building stuff out with the foresight of, of knowing that it might have to change. Um, it is just crazy seeing this stuff again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so another thing about staying in um, proxy, I mean, we wasted a bit of time with this, but, you know, I spent a while building out a proxy kit for like a dojo thing. And luckily I didn't texture it and go that far into production with it because we scrapped the whole thing, which was very, very saddening for me. But, um, you know, I, it, it would have been even more so if I'd, I'd spent loads more time kind of building this, um, this kit. So it's, it's like a, you know, it's a modular kit. You can't really see the pieces there, but um, you have roof pieces, straight pieces, corner pieces, and then um, uh, the same for the, the lower level and stuff, and then um, the bottom. Uh, yeah, so hopefully we'll get to build this out at some point. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, so then just another... Another great thing about building really flexible environment assets and kits that you can um, shape into anything is that we've got a couple of really great other maps out of it for our multiplayer. So this is uh, one of our multiplayer maps that we're just about to release. Um, so you're getting a little sneak of these guys. Um, yeah, built out of the same stuff. This one has the same lighting environment. But it's all the same assets, you know. It's not, no new assets, but it's a completely different environment, a completely different map. Um, so we're really kind of maximizing our investment on the time that we spent building this stuff. Um, same environment, um, but um, yeah. Yeah. So that's about it from me. Thank you. Is this on? Oh, okay, it's on. So yeah. I think, Drew, are you gonna lead the machine? Mm. Sure, sure. Yeah. So basically, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have the Q and A session, and Drew is going to be demoing uh, raw data. <coughs> so you'll be able to kind of see it in action on the back screen. We'll do some questions. Um, so I think we're gonna. It's gonna take a couple of minutes for them to switch things over. So does anyone have a question here? You can get started. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, so you mentioned how you had to wear multiple hats, and uh, I myself am making a game in VR. So I was wondering about the UI. I, cool. uh, were any of you directly involved with that, especially the main select screen? I was very in Impressed by that, uh, although it's not what I want, which is a mobile sort of tablet uh, select screen you can have. But uh, could any of you like speak to experiences of uh, working on that? So I had some involvement early on in building out that UI. Uh, let's just say UMG is probably one of the worst things I've ever touched in a long time. It's pretty much like building stuff with Dreamweaver, like uh, web page creation. It's not exactly the most intuitive. Um, that thing has gone through so many different iteration cycles. I mean, we've had help from the concept art, you know, our, our art director and concept artist, Daniel Zhao. It was me helping him out, trying to figure these things out. Um, a lot of the engineers having involvement there. And now we've got, you know, one of our combat designers also touching the UI. <laughs> so to be honest, like just about everybody has touched that UI at this point. And um, I, it, I think it's very cool. It works really nicely, but it's a miracle that that thing works. And like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you'll, you're, you're guaranteed that at least 
eight to ten people probably have worked on that thing. Okay. Did, were you looking for some advice on how? So I think he's looking to kind of create his own UI for his oh. own VR game. Do you have any advice for him? Don't do it with <laughs> UMG. <laughs> if you're going to build a UI for VR, for instance, right? Three dimensional elements are so essential. So mm -hmm. 3D buttons, it's mostly it. And, and you know, we were originally thinking about, oh, everything needs to be, what is the word, diegetic or I don't know, where it's like, okay, I'm going to crank a crank to then, and, you know, make this menu do something. Where in reality, you've, you quickly realize you need efficiency and you just need to be able to get through things really quickly. So, you know, the parallax is great to have. So anything that has depth to it, anything that overlaps, like those are the kinds of things that are interesting to play with. But for the most part, if you can do 2D UI design, transitioning into the, the VR space is actually not such a, a tough challenge. It's, it's all about the tools and then your artistic uh, vision. Uh, that's pretty much it. It's still a very much a 2D user interface just with 3D stereoscopy and, you know, uh, models as buttons and whatnot. But again, just think about the user experience when you're designing these things. Do not be making things obtuse or hard to understand. People are going to start complaining very quickly that they just can't figure out what they need to do. And even still with the UI we have, we've had to go back and revamp it and simplify it and just, yeah, gut a bunch of things out. And um, that's probably for the best. You want people to be able to get in and out of the game as soon as possible. And maybe sometimes it's good to do stuff that's a little, you know, a little kitschy or, you know, kind of gimmicky, but for the most part, stick to simple stuff. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree. And also, fidelity is a problem with yeah. VR. Yep. So text it can be very difficult to read when it starts to get smaller. Um, and people have different experiences with their level of fidelity in VR. Yeah. Just even, you know, the, 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 the distance you rise to your HMD and stuff like that, you know, yours might be slightly more blurry than the others. Yeah, aliasing is always a problem. Yep. And, you know, performance is a problem as well. Yep. It's transparencies. It's, Transparencies are a big no-no, you know. Yep. If you've got a big UI that's that's semi-transparent over your screen, that's going to hit you pretty hard, especially once you start to get VFX behind it. Um, yeah. So yeah, and I think you know, actually going away from traditional 2D UI is probably not a bad shout either, because you know, UI and VR can be something completely different. It doesn't have to be. I, we're still in that stage of trying to. Mm -hmm. 2D UI into into VR, and I think it'll it'll probably go somewhere else. And if you know if you're going to start to investigate different ways of doing UI with physicality and you know objects, then it's probably not a bad shout. So I guess it's good to like get people to keep test people who haven't seen the game before, like get them testing it, see what their feedback is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Another question. Okay, so Drew is playing raw data now on the back screen, I believe. So He's moving around. For, first and foremost, you might want to turn that resolution scale to go up. It's, a, it's pretty uh, sharp in there. <laughs> mm. Go to yeah, so that's the problem with the aliasing as well. You can see yes. it there. So yes. you can see the text is very difficult to read. So if you go to your op go into the options tab there. So here you can get to see him interacting with all this. So graphics tab. And then be very careful when you move that slider there. And the resolution multiplier, you want to move that up a few notches at the top. 11. Top, top, top. There you go. There you go. Be very careful. <laughs> oh, stop, 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 stop. Oh, God. Explode. Okay, okay. It, it didn't, huh? All right. Well, that, so essentially that slider is going to give you super sampling on your entire image. Um, it's, it's great for cleaning up the edges, but I guess uh, doesn't work. Yeah. it's not doing so great right now. Okay. Well, well, do, you, do you want to play a hard point level? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's taking like a part of the HMD, right, and projecting it onto well, the whole it, thing. Yeah. I believe it is because, yeah, one eye is being rendered right now on screen. Yeah, yeah, go ahead and do you. a hard point. So Mr. Wilson to my left uh, had added some new stuff to this level. So anybody who's seen this previous when it was released, it's changed pretty significantly, especially the floor areas. So it's looking really, really slick. And this is our first environment that we built way back, mm. what, it's almost a year and a year half and now half ago. ago. Um, so yeah, at the time, I think it was just me and Keith, and then we hired up Kevin Wilson here. Yeah, and we and just read as well, and yeah. read, and we yeah. bear, you know just went crazy on it, and was yeah. very happy with what what we produced. So this level is definitely much more of a stationary experience level. It wasn't initially intended for people to be able to um, move around until we've added teleporting, which then of course 
people got to get up a little closer to everything in the environment. So in, in here, you get lower down and you start hacking this terminal and uh, bots start to emerge from the pods and you just gotta survive. Oh, this is a really old build. <laughs> How old is this? Oh, floor. this is the old floor. <laughs> this is my old crappy floor. All right. Yeah, we so initially built out this level um, before we had teleportation. So you were, you were stuck in the middle there and you yeah. were just using, moving around in the immediate um, vicinity and using these things as cover. So this sequence right here is, is uh, a little kind of like cinematic sequence that I worked on with Arlington uh, Cruz, who's our animator, who was our only animator for quite a while. He worked on almost every animation in the game at one point. Um, and so yeah, yeah, this is supposed to be your dramatic moment before all hell breaks loose. <laughs> no audio. No, uh, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> 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 kind of intense now. Can we take another question or do you want to yeah. keep talking? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, go okay. yeah. Hi, um, I think I'm probably a little bit in the minority here because I'm actually a sound designer, uh, not so much visual, but um, I kind of had a, a two-part question uh, in, regards to, uh, in regards to that and in VR. One being, um, obviously, like you said, VR is a very different environment than uh, usual um, 2D gaming and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering how um, not just has that impacted your work visually, like you've been saying, but how the correlation between the audio and the video has changed, and the second part being sound designers like myself, is there anything that we can do to help accommodate those differences and things that might be more difficult or different now in VR? Um, I, think, I think the biggest thing is spatialization, right? Um, you, the fact that you can move your head around and get close to something, meaning it should, get, it should just naturally react like it does in real life, whereas in most games it's all usually stereo or 5.1. Regardless of where you are, the sound doesn't change. So um, and in VR, you're using your body so much, and we actually have levels where you're ducking under things. And you know, so the idea that not being able to see something but hear it at just the right level is very important. Um, and Unreal has got a lot of that stuff built in under the hood, but it takes quite a bit of setup still to just get the attenuation correct. And like, even I've had to mess with some of the sound in the game. Um, but uh, does that kind of give you some answer to what you're looking for? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Okay, do we have any other questions? Okay. Um, hello, uh, I have a question about the movement in virtual reality, so uh, right now you're uh, using teleportation, and mm. I was w wondering if you're were uh, approaching, uh, were using different approaches, like locomotion or like redirected walking. Okay. Um, if okay. you had any experience experimenting, because that's one of the biggest uh, VR problems right now, right? Like how we move. So right now uh, we we are doing teleportation, but we just did a PVP. Uh, closed beta, which is now I believe going open beta this weekend, which will have full-on locomotion. And there's uh, quite a few mo locomotion schemes that we're uh, going to make available to you. And this is something that, you know, Servios, in the law, you know, when we first started here, uh, we were building out games to be played like how we expected them to be played. And, you know, we realized, okay, well, people kind of get sick when they move around in VR. So now we can't let them move anymore. And now I think everybody's getting their sea legs and they're able to actually play the game like we expected them to play the game. And uh, so very soon you're going to see exactly what you're wanting. That's pretty much the best I can put it. Uh, one more question is, what's your experience working with IMAX VR? Or, and uh, like if you could comment if it was a success or like there are a lot of traffic going through and if you get any valuable data out of it or something like that. So, so you're asking about the IMAX VR, the one that's by the Grove? Uh, yes. So I've gotten a chance to visit that place myself. Um, great facility, really, really cool. And it definitely had a good amount of foot traffic going in there. I remember there was two guys who came in and they spent $150 on VR sessions just by themselves. So it was, it was uh, pretty enlightening. And I, I, w I was expecting it to be a ghost town in there, honestly. But I think their location has done really well. Raw data um, is definitely doing good. They said it's one of the best games performance-wise that they've got in there. Um, so I, I, I think it's only going to get better. That's where I tried it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. OK. 
Okay, next question here. Thank you all for coming and uh, talking. Um, my question is kind of more of a general industry question. Um, for me, getting into game design is kind of a second career path, um, and so I can't uh, afford to be a poor student anymore. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of being able to get into the industry before your skills are kind of up to that level in terms of getting in from the admin side, things like that, do you have any advice in that sense? Um, well, I, I think you should absolutely be digging into scripting at home. I mean, there's nothing stopping you from being able to at least understand how blueprints work and just how to do trigger volumes, changing colors on lights, making animations play. Those are like essential things that constantly are happening in the game. Um, and then in terms of getting your foot in the door, I would say QA is not a bad way to go, although it might be the, a little bit tougher of a transition because you might not be afforded that opportunity off the bat. It's something that you're going to have to get yourself in and then bring those things that you've built at home with you and show the other designers and engineers what you can do. And then that from there, that should blossom you over. I mean, that, that'll do it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do we have any more? Questions in the stage? Yes. So I'm really a fish out of water here. I'm actually a motion capture actor. Mm. Uh, and I came here kind of curious to see what, or if you guys even had an opinion kind of on how motion capture data is used in virtual reality um, game development and game design, as opposed to how it's been used kind of traditionally for the past 10, 10 years or so uh, in the industry. So, uh, a lot of the technologies that motion capture uses is very similar to motion control in VR, right? You're just having uh, cameras that look at points and those points are tracked by those cameras. And then you can update, put positions of things real t run at runtime. So the more points of, uh, you know, contact that we have, so be it your, your hips, your neck, you know, your top of your head, you're going to get way more articulation and way more realism out of things. So unfortunately, the VR is an expensive thing to have at home. and Right? We, the best we've got right now is two hands and a head. And there's a lot of things on the uh, uh, engineering side that people have done at Servios that incredible stuff to allow us to be able to move our hands in relation to our body and have the, everything just kind of work together as best as it can. And there's still just a ton of work to be done there before it really gets to a point where the visual fidelity matches you know, what you see in most games. Um, so they're, they're, it's really just a matter of uh, access. So as, as these devices become cheaper and you know, developers are able to you know, integrate that more into their products, meaning it has to just be available for people to use it at home, then you'll start to see that this crazy change in visuals just happens overnight. Motion capture, Mo motion capture just primarily Yeah, actually that's true. We do have some motion. But yeah, yeah, as far as player characters are concerned, there will be a time when maybe you have like the third person character that kind of is uh, playing a different set of animation than what the player is in real life doing, but all the enemies are like either hand keyed animation or motion captured, and that's still a very viable like method. But as far as your avatar is concerned, it's gonna take some more research for sure. Cool, thank you so much. Thank you, any more on the stage? Did I see a hand? Yes. We have one from a live stream viewer too, so I'll read that out after. Hi, hello. Hi, I was wondering how you guys approached uh, the hurdles of um, ex uh, your storyline with the limitations of switching um, levels and uh, the movement of the pro progression in VR, how you, uh, how you tackled uh, progression of your, your ultimate storyline. Did so it affect? So virtual reality effect. This is, you're, you want me to answer about the narrative of the game, like how are we approaching being able to tell the stories and how do we make that a continuous like, loop, right? Um, well, I mean, each level is still a level. It still has its own set of dialogue that gets played through. Uh, and you experience that dialogue and that's kind of going to give you more of an insight as to what's going on. Um, and we also have other narrative devices like things that you can pick up in the world that are uh, readable. And that's the most we can do at the moment, like we, you know, making cinematics or making events happen in the game that the player may not see because they're not focused, you know what I mean, is very hard to do and just very time consuming and it's, it's just a very expensive process. So like eventually we would love to get some stuff in the game that's 
you know, just more dramatic, has more animation, has, has more NPCs that are not just there to kill you. So those are things that will just naturally happen. I mean, other games are potentially already going in that direction just because they might have the budgets to make that happen. So, so you we're, used assets and characters to move the story forward into the ultimate That would ending. That would be my hope, is that we will be doing it. Right now we use a lot of uh, audio elements. So it's mostly you're getting, you're getting information from some of the uh, environment and you're also getting it through your ear from somebody outside of the environment and then you're also picking up objects in the world that are going to tell you a bit more. And of course we'll have things on the walls like propaganda, little messages here and there that just kind of give you a little bit extra. I look forward to playing it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, were there any more on the stage? Um, okay, so we have a question from Nikhil um, watching on live stream from India. Um, so they would like to know about future opportunities in VR technology for games and film from the point of view of a VFX artist. So yeah. that might be a good question for James, maybe? Your opportunities. Well, I mean, I think there's a lot of stuff to figure out in, um, in VFX. I think it's, you know, if I, I'm not sure what other people think about, like, you know, transitioning 3D modeling over to VR, but it, it, it seems more similar, but like in, in um, VR, you have to just, the depth factor just really changes how you have to approach all your VFX. So I think that's going to open up a wide range of opportunities, you know, in the future. Like right now, VR is still kind of um, small, but I think once it really blossoms and, and people start using these, figuring out like new techniques for how to make, you know, fully volumetric explosions or things that really feel 3D, I think that's going to be a, a really big thing that's uh, been a valuable skill that will drive the industry forward. Um, do you think that kind of answers what he was asking? I think so. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, any other questions on the stage? Last chance. I was at, oh, we do. Okay. Hi there. Yes, also for, uh, I believe, James is your name? I'm sorry. Um, so you mentioned in your speech that uh, for like VFX animation, it's really good to wear multiple hats and maybe like get some, like your feet wet in like C++ or Perl or something. Um, how deep would you suggest going down that rabbit hole? Because say I just would like to, to make, you know, spells and particles mm -hmm. and fun explosions. Um, I mean, I, I assume it's based on the, you know, company to company experience, but I don't know. You could just speak on that a little. Like how to kind of get your foot in and learn some more of like the technical scripting and programming stuff well, you might? No, more like, um, I, what like is the do practical? I really have to learn? Oh, what's C++? the practical what's use the, of it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good thing. That's probably something I should have um, uh, clarified more. So like um, one big thing with VFX is that it's interactive. Um, and, you know, you know, like a model is usually like a, a static thing, but like VFX, you know, they spawn and they behave in a certain way and they change over time and they might, you know, VFX might, um, for instance, like Boss, when he charges up his punch, you know, it kind of has a build-up effect and then when you move it away, it kind of goes down. Mm -hmm. And you can just, you know, have a programmer or designer like hook up all that stuff and then, and then you can just come in there at the end and kind of like just plug in your different effects. But I think if you do it that way, there's kind of a disconnect between the two people and it's much easier if you can like get in there and just mess around with blueprints and like say like, okay, so you know, when I get this close, I'm gonna trigger this thing based on these conditions and then when these conditions happen, I'm gonna trigger this effect. And if you can set up the triggers okay. yourself, it helps you uh, make the effect, you know, to actually make the effect and the game logic mesh together better. Additionally, like I think in any kind of, um, as any kind of artist, like if you know some kind of Python scripting or something, it can just help you be a much more valuable person to mm -hmm. your team, you know, especially if you have downtime, you don't have other things to work on, you could just develop some Python scripts to help um, improve your workflow, you know, help asset management, or, um, you know, just, for instance, um, I created like a little quick script in Maya to just set like random vertex colors on a bunch of different faces, and I mean, there might be other ways to do it, but the, that kind of thing allowed me to very quickly, you know, um, do something that might be tedious by hand, just setting a bunch of vertex yeah. colors manually. Right. So those are kind of some examples of where you can use those technical skills. Well, thank, thank you, I appreciate that. 
Okay, awesome. I did just get one more question on lives. One second. Okay, question. so Dario is asking for your thoughts. Uh, so any speaker here, your thoughts on other purposes for VR environments other than gaming and film. So for example, education software, science simulations. Do you guys have any thoughts on that? I'm sorry, could you say, ask that question again? <laughs> um, so Dario is asking on live stream, can anyone talk about their thoughts on other purposes for VR environments, so other than gaming and film? So things like education software, science simulations, do you have any thoughts on sure. um, those industries? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's a bunch of, uh, people are doing a lot of training stuff with, um, with VR at the moment, and you know, and simulation type stuff. Um, the training, so there is definitely opportunities there. I know of a, of a bunch of companies that are, are doing training simulations, and you know whether it's environment artwork is is um, inquiring about. Then yeah, that stuff needs that stuff built out, you know, and that may be more more attuned to um, the visual stuff. Might be more attuned to architectural visualization and more simulator type stuff, where it's more accurate and more technical. But the the creative processes and well, more the technical processes are still the same as as game development uh, or for VR and, and stuff like that. I wouldn't say necessarily for film because that's a different thing um, entirely. Um, okay. It doesn't really have depth. It's stereo, but it doesn't have interactable depth. I mean, ultimately, VR VR can you know give, <laughs> VR can do so much for people in general in terms of being able to visualize anything. I mean, mm -hmm. when you when you have the actual yeah. spatial awareness of, of a place. I mean, even medically, being able to go inside of a vein cavity or something like that and see calcium build or whatever would be there. I don't know, I'm not a doctor, but, you know, just being able to see something close up and being able to observe the size of these things and, like, you know, looking, to, looking from the outside instead of looking from the inside, those kinds of ideas. Yeah. Um, I, I think um, just, just like YouTube um, kind of uh, paved the way for user-generated content, I think uh, there is room for growth in user... Um, captured content, uh, as you're mentioning, possible mocap, when that matures, um, you can pretty much, uh, you know, play cosplay. You can be in any avatar you want, and you can uh, be the character, and you can uh, be a troll, or you can talk about politics, you can do um, just anything, and, and and present yourself as a host on YouTube, and um, I can definitely see a community that's building of uh, everyone just being these uh, 3D avatars. So I think there's a lot of uh, growth in that, uh, social, um, basically user-generated <laughs> content. An another thing that could be a really big potential is uh, you know, creating content in VR, because like, as, a, as a game artist, you, know, you spend a lot of time using a 2D mouse on a 2D screen, but you're creating 3D content. So if you could some, and p people are starting to develop tools in this way, like uh, Tilt Brush and um, and Quill, and I think Google announced some new thing called Blocks or something. And then Unreal has like uh, an actual VR editor where you can move stuff around. So I think like as that starts to you know grow more and more, people will, you know, when creating 3D content, do it more and more with inside VR, and and that'll probably expand not just in the games but also into like architectural visualization and um, all kinds of of industries. Okay. Oh, another question right here. Awesome. Um, have you guys heard about any companies working on um, multi-person VR experiences yet? Like, you're talking about like a shared room experience? Or? Yeah, yeah. Um, it, that's absolutely happening. There's a place called The Void. Hmm. I believe they're in Utah. I can't remember, but they're doing a completely warehouse scale VR experience where you're wearing backpacks and you have a gun and you just you're not tethered to anything. And there's get, like multiple people yep. in the experience. Yep. Oh, okay. And cool. they'll you know they map the environment to your to your HMD. So it's it's pretty revolutionary stuff. And I think something like that's going to become a lot more prevalent. Right. It, you know, just take a little time. <laughs> I'm just a little surprised it's there and not here. It would be great to have that here. We, we also have networked multiplayer as well. Right, um, right. I don't know if that's what, what... But this is more he wants to be able to interact right. with me oh, and you are here okay. together. Yeah, I can yeah, touch yeah. you and... <laughs> <laughs> gets real Thank weird. You. It does get real weird in VR. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Okay. Oh, and we have another... <laughs> they keep popping up. Okay. All right. Hi. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, I have a question 
about, about how much time did you spend to put this whole uh, experience together from design to the product we're seeing here? Well, I, the, the cool thing about when I work is I get to see how many hours I've spent in the editor. So when I look on Steam, I think I'm well over 4,000 or 5,000 hours or so. That's, that's just based off of Steam. So if you include all the time previous to that, I would say it's, I mean, it's been a three-year ordeal. Um, everybody has come in and put in extra time and coming in on the weekends and it's just been a really, you know, everybody's, it's a labor of love. People really believed in it. So it, that's pretty much the best way to sum it up. It's been about three years to make this whole product. And there's things that you guys haven't even seen that were developed before all this stuff as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, um, again. <laughs> it's, it's actually just to, to kind of keep going with, with that. Have you had to play catch up at all with technology? Because three years in tech speak, that's like, like dinosaur time almost. <sighs> like the way it has rapidly as things have evolved. I don't, if, if anything, there was things that we were doing in the past that I think were more advanced than what's currently what's going on. I, mean, I can think of one example. Um, so like recently Unreal Engine released like a forward render, okay. which like uh, is just a different way of, of rendering the scene to kind of get better anti-aliasing in VR. And so then, um, you know, a few months ago we rolled everything over to, uh, to now use the forward render and you get like much crisper, um, you know, much crisper visuals, but you have to like then go through everything you made and make sure it still works and all your, yeah. and everything's still fine. So th that kind of stuff happens, but you just have to roll with it, I guess. Well, and I think what's funny about that is forward renderers were the de facto before the deferred renderers. So it's actually, we're yeah. kind of stepping backwards in time to get some of the benefits of that, which is mostly I IQ image quality. So it, yeah, in terms of um, do, being behind or do we feel like we're having to play catch up? I don't think so at this point, it's, but it could happen eventually. I mean, it, it's inevitable if you don't keep on top of everything. Okay, I think that was the last one. I was wondering, can I embarrass one of our alumni up the front? Please I was do. Just, <laughs> Please do. I'm kind of curious. So these guys haven't been at, how long have you been at Servios? Since February. So I'm just curious, like, how have you found it as a new graduate working in a, a new studio like Servios? Don't you say anything uh, bad. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure, your listening. bosses are right. <laughs> You're dead to uh, me, Rodrigo. It's, great. it's a super fun place. Uh, these guys are amazing. They're uh, helping us with anything that we need. Uh, like they said, you know, it's it's uh, us getting in there. Uh, there's a lot of things that we don't know uh, that we have to learn as we go. So in the day to day, so they're very helpful. So technically, what kind of things have you been learning? Like optimization. <laughs> yeah, boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, but it's good. It's good to know it, and, and uh, it's super helpful for the rest of the team to, that we know it as well. So, um, cool, yeah. awesome. Thank you, buddy. thank you. Sorry, love, love I knew too. I couldn't tell him before. I was like, I'll do it later. Okay, any other questions? No, you do. Okay, we'll take this as the last one, guys. Okay. Yeah. So, hi, I'm Carlos. Hi. And um, there, there's different VR headsets, and obviously there's uh, the gear, right? Mm -hmm. um, what do you guys feel about the mobile VR versus PC? Ooh. And I know, yeah, it's a very broad. <laughs> Shots spend, fired. <laughs> you, could spend, uh, you could spend an hour talking about that. Maybe let's see. Okay, so so mobile VR has uh, a lot of potential. I mean, mobile in general has a lot of potential. If you look at the headsets that are going to be coming out in the future, they have the inward outward tracking. So like, you don't even need uh, external cameras to get positional tracking anymore. So you're going to see that that is going to become a much more uh, approachable thing. I don't know, v mobile VR will potentially be the future. I mean, everything is going to be detethered de anyways. Um, so when the input devices are there and the tracking is good enough, and also think about the performance, right? Luckily, uh, AMD has got things like Vulkan, and we have you know, these lower level APIs that allow us to pump out some good performing graphics on mobile. So it's just a matter of time before these kind of lines blur, I guess. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's have another big round of applause for all our guests.